Hey everyone, Jono here. Despite having a highly questionable storyline, in our last run we were able to successfully beat the game using only a Beast Warrior deck, so let's go ahead and add a star chip to that board. Based on your comments, I'll also be adding another category to this list, for Exodia specifically. Spoiler alert, I playtested this, and it is significantly worse than Rituals. So thanks for that I guess. Anywho, you have all flooded me with a variety of types to pick from. After our Christmas video, I think I've recovered enough to rip the bandage off and take on the Pyro Challenge. Before we begin, here's a quick recap of the rules. On to the type analysis we go. Pyro are an underrepresented type in Forbidden Memories. There are a total of 9 cards, with 7 of them being made available to the player as early as the starting deck. The remaining 2 are unlockable as the story progresses. That's of course if you can beat the doors that they're attached to. So yeah, have fun with that one. This is what our starting deck looks like. There will be a number of cards included that are simply there to fill up space. I think this is the first deck outside of Sea Serpent that actually main decks Dark Hole. Gotta make sure I come up with a catchphrase for that one but we'll deal with that when we get to it. For now, it's time for the story. Ah, oh, for goodness sake, wake up. Ah, what? Holy crap, where am I? What the hell is this? You need to set Millennium Egypt on fire. But why? You just gotta do it, man. It's a canon event. Won't that make me the bad guy? Don't worry. You get to set yourself on fire as well. Immolation is life. Immolation is the literal opposite of life. Whatever. Talk to me when you start the reptile run. Okay, thanks. Bye. So, do I call an Uber or... Oh my god. No, 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 no. Don't my prince me, you bandaged ice brick. I just got crapped out by a snake. So much for you being my caretaker. I traveled to a different game universe and you didn't even notice. I wish Lara Croft never let you out of that freezer. Seriously, and your first response is to challenge me to a duel. Friggin' parenting skills of the third Hokage. You know what? Maybe the phallic flame viper has a point. I think we do need to set this place on fire. But we can't do it alone. Dare I say it? I think we need to find some friends. But first things first, we need to throw Simon right back in the freezer where he belongs. I guess that explains his nice shade of blue. Moseying on to the last few turns of the duel, Simon has nothing to defend against us. Speaking of defending against us, for all of you out there, post in the comments if Simon has ever pulled out an Exodia against you. I have never experienced it in all my years of playing this game, so I'm very curious to see if that's actually happened to anyone. With all those shenanigans aside, let's try and recruit some delinquents over at the Duel Arena. Starting of course, with our friend Tina. Now, the terms of recruitment are simple. I challenge you to a duel. If you win, you get to go about your day doing whatever it is you were doing before. However, if I win, you need to grab some matches and tag along with me. Comprende? Good. Love it, let's get back to the duel. Now, in the absolute monster of a first hand, I drew two Raigekis in a dark hole. That is completely overkill for an opponent that's at Tina's level, so we decide to discard those. Now, for these early duels in Egypt, I'm going to share some insights into what it's like playing with a pyro deck in this game, and hopefully, figure out our overall strategy in the process. Frankly, at this point in the game, any monster over a thousand attack is more than enough to get you to the preliminary duels in the modern times. Due to the sheer garbageness that is our deck, you'll see me spamming almost the same two cards for these duels. Forgive me, not much I can do at this point, and you better get used to it. With all that said, we're on to the final turn of the duel. Attacking Tina with our last card, she drops us a Dancing Elf. Welcome to the Immolation Nation, Tina. On to our next victim, sorry, I mean recruit. And next up, it's Giselle. You know how this works, Giselle. If you lose, you get a box of matches. If you win, I set you on fire. Either way, I'm getting what I want. What I don't want, however, is a Dark Witch at 1800 attack. I can't believe I'm doing this, but I have to fire off an early Raigeki to wipe this. Oh boy. Now, what is it like playing this deck? It's not great, but it's not as bad as I thought. I'll start off by saying that Pyros have no fusions within their type. They have plenty of them when mixed with other types, but none within their own. This is because the secondary typing of all Pyro monsters is also Pyro. I got into this deck thinking that I could easily fuse into a Flame Swordsman, but sadly I cannot, and this knowledge sucks. I'll continue this in the next duel, because we've defeated Giselle, 
and old mate drops us da -da -da -da, a Milus Radiant. Welcome to the Immolation Nation, mate. Collect your matches by the door. We are now up against Malai Ruka, which is rather handy for us. Given that he is a juvenile, he won't go to prison, or at least the big boy prison. So he has a perfect pyromaniac disguise right out the gate. And as a bonus, if all else fails, we can throw him into an air vent. Now, with all that said, let's get back to the deck analysis. Our strongest card in our deck is Fire Yaru at 1300 attack. This is followed by Cherub and Fire Knight at 1100. All other monsters are under 1000 attack, which is pretty horrendous. The only saving grace we have is in Dragon Piper, which has 1800 defense points. It's a little slow in terms of momentum, but having a defensive wall is something I really appreciate with a deck this week. Now, I'll pause right there for now, because we're down to our last two turns. Molai Ruka sets nothing, and we fire off a Raigeki to speed things up. We attack the game with Cherub and Fire Knight, and we win. Da -da -da -da, and we get a Stone Armadillo. Here you go. Here are some crushed up sparklers and a lighter. With the accidental jump cut, we are now up against Old Greg. With the illusion of being senile, I think Old Greg is one of our best recruits. We might just need to figure out if he hasn't actually gone senile before we add him to our ranks. Given the latest play he did where he attacked into our monster, it's not looking too good. With a 3300 attack point hit to his life points, we hand back over to Greg who decides this time he wants to be a challenge to us. This is a good opportunity to showcase how you can change the guardian star of a monster once it's already been summoned. You can change the sign by attempting a fusion that fails. In this scenario, we attempted to equip a card to a monster which it was not compatible with. The same outcome can be achieved by using a spell card or a trap card. And speaking of, I have a crap load of dark holes in my hand. I have no idea what to do with them. But no matter, we're getting down to the last few turns of the duel. Summoning a Cherub and Fire Knight, we attack away his monster with one of them, attack again with Fire Yaru, and lastly with another Cherubin. We win, da -da -da -da, and old Greg drops us an Allen way. I think for everyone's safety, you get a free pass, old man. Tina informs us of another potential recruit over by the town square. Making our way over, we see some mages protesting for a total fire ban this season. Wading through the crowd, we find Jono dueling against Seto in an attempt to convince him to allow cigarettes back into Millennium Egypt. Sorry Jono, this isn't the Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero manga. No smoking allowed. Seto confronts us, looking to confiscate any fire starters we may have, but he's thankfully interrupted by his lower mages. I think it's high time we make it back to the duel arena to hide our stuff. Seeking to join our cause, we challenge Jono to initiate him into the Immolation Nation. It's such a catchy name, but sadly, if all goes well, there really won't be anybody left to remember it. Now, let's get back to the deck analysis, and we'll move the monsters aside for the time being. We'll instead go over all the equipped cards compatible with Pyro Monsters. All Pyro Monsters are compatible with Salamandra. This is also a good way to figure out if a monster has a secondary type of Pyro. This is why the card works on monsters like Blast Juggler and Metal Dragon. As for everything else, most of the other Pyro monsters are compatible with Invigoration, Dark Energy, and Raise Body Heat. Before I go on, I just want to point out a feature asked about in the previous video. The cards Legendary Sword and Sword of Dark Destruction both have bespoke animations when you equip them to a monster. That's why sometimes you see that random sword pop up when I use it. Anywho, this brings us to the end of the duel. With our final attack, Jono drops us a weather control. Hmm, second time that card's dropped for us. Before we can welcome Jono into the Immolation Nation, Seto busts into the arena looking for contraband. Him and his goon squad have been tasked with investigating any leads pertaining to arson. Looking to gain more information, he challenges us to a duel. And right off the bat, this guy decides to be a problem for us. At least for a solid one turn. Now given that our starting deck has almost every equipped card in existence, the starting part of the game isn't really a problem for us. So let's get back to the Pyro analysis. Here is my game plan for the Pyro deck. We'll need to rely on Fire Yaru and Cherubin Fire Knight until we're at a point in the game where we can unlock Vermilion Sparrow and Flame Cerberus. The bulk of our deck will then need to consist of equipped cards solely for those four monsters, with the rest of the deck being filled with a mix of spell and trap cards. I would also go as far as to include filled spells in the deck simply to cancel out other monsters and to bait the mages into using their own field spells. But we'll shift things as we go along. We are now entering the last turn of the duel. With a trusty Rageki in hand, we fire off a Rageki for the win and attack for game. We win, da -da 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 -da, and we got a dig beak. 
which I thought was called Big Deke a long time ago. Putting the suck in unsuccessful, Seto slinks away in defeat. Time to put our plan together to set the town ablaze. I make my way to the palace to gather my materials. Sup, blue man. Second time you've lost me today. Poor way of showing consistency, my dude. Retreating to his den, Simon continues his game of matchsticks. He is still stuck on figuring out how to make the barn face left by only moving one match. Suddenly, we hear doors being broken down outside and witness a fire spreading throughout the palace. Haishin bursts in with his fire brigade and begins fighting the blaze. All thanks to his Millennium firefighting equipment. Rumbling occurs and Fizdis rouses us up from our room. She tells us it's no longer safe to be here. Seto sweeps in and rescues her from the upper balcony, giving us enough time to run outside. Confronted once more, we're interrogated as to how the fire was started. It wasn't me this time, mate. Somebody beat me to it. Suddenly, the blue bandit pops up and hands us a Millennium Molotov. Turns out, after all this time, Simon was on our side and had secretly set a number of charges throughout the town. Remembering his name for the first time, we run off to continue the good work. We bump into Haishin, who's demanding we hand over the Molotov. We refuse, so he challenges us to a duel. Now, Haishin. This guy is our biggest problem, but also our biggest opportunity. If we are able to defeat him, he has a 0.5% chance of dropping Flame Cerberus, the strongest pyro card in this game. That's right, 0.5%. I think we can all agree that there may be a slight problem with that. I don't think we can do it with our current deck right now. It is horrendously weak. More than likely, we'll end up having to grind star chips in free duel in order to get it. But, I'll give it a go either way since he won't have Yami activated in those duels. Firing off a dark hole for the goal, we can only hope that it baits him into using a face down. Which hell freaking yeah, it does. Unfortunately, I think I am one equip card short from being able to survive the next turn. Nonetheless, let's see how we go. Okay, draw, summon, and it is... an absolute cop-out. A literal 50 life point short. We throw off another Raigeki, but looks like our luck has run out. He drops a beastie 4300 Zero Demont, and we go down. But that's okay, it's a cannon event. With Haishin regrettably defeating us, Simon grabs onto him. During the scuffle, we drop the Millennium Molotov cocktail. Welp, sorry my dude, guess we need to sit here until we respawn. I think that's how human life works in Millennium Egypt. Whilst we wait for that, let's check out what's going on in the present. Based on our current timeline of January 2024, there has not been a YCS event. Ironically, the current TCG meta seems to be getting support for Fire Kings of all things. Gotta show some love to the exploding Dronza. It's gotta be one of my favourite genders. Now that we're at Tina, we save our game and start our attempt at winning a Flame Cerberus. Our trusty Fire Lion can be won from Haishin at any rank. Defeating him is actually doable if you get a lucky first turn. Most of the win condition involves drawing a Raigeki or a Dark Hole in turn 1, then beefing up Fire Yara to 3300 attack, like so. Remember kids, this is Forbidden Memories. The game does not like you. It will never like you. And in those moments where you think it does like you, bam, it reminds you that it does not. Now, we have two choices here to grind for this card. Option 1 is winning 137 duels against Tina or Simon with a minimum A rank. At 1.5 minutes a duel, this will take me close to 3.5 hours. Option 2 is grinding against Haishin. Flame Cerberus has a drop rate of 0.5%. To put that in perspective, breeding a shiny Pokemon using the Masuda method is roughly a 0.2% chance. So at a rate of 0.5%, I'll need to win an average of 200 duels for this card to drop at least once. Stay with me, this is where things start to go downhill. My current win rate is about 1 in 5. So if I'm winning 200 duels, I'm losing about a thousand of them in the process. Now here's the real clincher. Each duel against Haishin takes me about 2.5 minutes to complete. If I win 200 duels consecutively, that's 8 hours. Happy days. Given that my current win rate is 1 in 5, I'll need to play 1,200 duels to get an average of 200 wins. Let's tally that up using the magic of ChatGPT, and this will take me an average of 50 hours just to win one copy of Flame Cerberus from Haishin. Not wanting to waste two and a half days of my life, I went with the first option, and redeemed the card via the Starship Trader. This is what our deck looks like. I've swapped out two copies of Cherub and Fire Knight for the Bombastic Fire Eye purely because of its equip card compatibility. All other junk cards have been subbed out and replaced with Flame Cerberus. Back to the game. Leaving the shop, we fire off our first duel of the prelims against Rex Raptor. 
Now, for the next couple of matches, so long as we pull out a monster over 2000 attack, we should be fine. So with that said, let's kick off the trivia. Starting first with Flame Viper. Flame Viper is the Pyro counterpart of Serpent Marauder, and the weaker counterpart at that. In the TCG, Flame Viper is the first non-fire Pyro-type monster. It's also the first Earth Pyro-type monster prior to the introduction of Gem Knights. As for its release, it was included as part of the McDonald's Pack 2 and has not been reprinted in any other booster pack since. So you know, good luck trying to find it. As for its anime appearances, it was one of the weak monster cards that Chaz rescued from the Reject Well. And that's about it for Flame Viper. You'll find that a lot of these Pyro cards are rather obscure, so the trivia is going to be a bit light. But never fear, even if I fire off two sets of trivia, I have some other things in my back pocket that I want to share with you. But enough of that now, Rex goes down and we win a graveyard in the hand of invitation. We win, hooray, time to save our game and it's on to Weevil Underwood. I'm expecting a relatively easy time against him, as most of his insect cards are a Jupiter Guardian Star, which is weak to Mars, a star all Pyro monsters have. Starting our first turn with a brick, I can see this one's going to take a while. So, let's jump onto some more trivia. This time, we're going to be looking at the card Hinotama Soul. Despite similarities in the Japanese names, Hinotama Soul is not related to the card Hinotama. Go figure. Instead, this Demi Miramon lookalike is a reference to the Hitodama Yokai, the blue flaming wisp ball thingies. In the anime, this card only debuted in the Capsule Monster episodes. It was used to help Yugi torch down the Tramp Forest, which is very fitting for this run. That's why I included it in the deck. As for its appearance in the TCG, it only debuted in Legend of Blue Eyes and has not been reprinted since. And that's about it. Jeez, like I said, not a lot of trivia. Given that there's still a good chunk of the duel left, I'll throw out another card. This time, we're going to look at Wings of Wicked Flame. This card debuted in Astral Pack 4 as a short print and has not been reprinted since. The card is a fusion material for the monster Marvelous, which is a winged beast in this game but surprisingly, also has a secondary typing of Pyro. I'll cover those a bit later in the run, as there are a crap load of secondary type Pyro cards in this game. And that brings us to the end of the Wings of Wicked Flame trivia. Shortest recap I've given. We are on to the last turns of the game. Spamming the field with literally every card in my deck, we destroy his monster with Flame Cerberus, and attack the game with Fire Yaru. We win, da -da 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 -da, and we got a Dimensional Warrior. Oh, I forgot a bit of trivia about Wings of Wicked Flame. It's also one of the other cards Chaz pulled out of the Reject Well. But enough of that, it's on to my Valentine. Now, my starting hand is going to showcase why I limited the number of Cherubin Fire Knights in my deck. This card has only three compatible equip cards. Salamandra, Invigoration, and Legendary Sword. Doesn't get raised body heat, doesn't get dark energy, doesn't get black pendant. Which makes it a rather dead draw most of the time. Vermilion Sparrow, when we eventually get it, is also going to have this problem. But by the time I use it, I'm likely going to need Megamorph to survive the mages. But we'll see how that goes when we get to it. Now, back to the game. Given the sheer amount of Raigeki that I've had in my hand, I think the game is trying to tell me that I need to use it for the entirety of this duel. So, we're going to do just that. And whilst we do it, I'm going to rattle off some trivia. And whilst we're on the subject, we might as well recap Cherubin the Fire Knight. In Forbidden Memories, fusing a warrior and a pyro monster under 1100 attack will result in this card. If you throw another warrior at it, it will fuse once more into Flame Swordsman, so long as the attack total of both cards is under 1800. As for the TCG, this card is also a fusion monster, albeit it's obtained by fusing Hinotama Soul with Monster Egg. For its anime appearances, it was only mentioned once in the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX dub. It was during episode 11 in a flashback between Jaden and Cyrus, Cyrus for some reason mentions that Jaden took this card from him. And how's that for timing? We've reached the end of this duel. We win, and my drops us a winged dragon number two. Let's go save our game and gear up for the last qualifying match against Bandit Keith. I'm not expecting him to be too difficult an opponent, but he can slow us down with his defense monsters, and I guess the occasional dark elf if we draw a bad hand. So on that, let's continue the trivia. And we're actually almost out of monster cards on that one. Anywho. The card we'll be covering this duel is the monster card Fire Eye. The criminally offensive bombastic Fire Eye. Sorry for the cultural appropriation there. You can blame the TikToks for that one. Fire Eye is an OCG only card, being released in Booster Pack 1. Though it doesn't have an official counterpart, it bears somewhat of a resemblance to Mystic Macro Carpa Seed. Yes, I was clutching at the straws for that one. As for its anime appearances, it appeared as a dual spirit in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Episode 34, 
in the duel between Kyber Man and Jaden. And that's about it for the trivia on this card. And look at that, right on time. We fire off our Aigeki for the win, and attack for game. We win. Duh, 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 duh. And we got a mechanic. Wow, that's a great drop. Hope our machine runs as good as this. Anywho, time to save the game, and it's onto a cutscene. Joey pulls us aside to explain his latest conspiracy theory. He believes that Nightmare Phoenix is an inferior ripoff of Death Phoenix Avatar of Doom. Please, tell me more. Exploring the logic behind this theory, we're both interrupted by Shadi, who couldn't care less about our Phoenix discussion, and is desperately looking for someone to touch him. I call dibs on that one. Phasing past the white light, we meet our past self. Rather than asking for revival, he simply hands us several sheets of match strikers, and tells us to continue his legacy in the future. Well, we have some strike paper, now time to collect some things to strike them with to start some fires. Shardy's two Millennium items seem to be a great method for doing this. So, we return to the tournament and challenge him to a duel. Now, say it with me everyone, Shardy is a pushover of a duelist. If you lose to him, you suck at this game, and you should immediately quit Yu-Gi-Oh and burn your copy of this CD. I know I harp on about Shardy, but he is genuinely designed by the game to be a weak opponent. His deck is skewed into comprising of monsters that are under a thousand attack. The best way I can showcase this is his deck composition formula. He has a number of cards under a thousand attack that have a 6.45% chance of being included in the deck, and almost everything over a thousand has a 0.05% chance of being included. But enough of that, let's watch a 3D battle. Well that was psychedelic as hell. Truthfully, I accidentally hit the square button when performing that attack. So there's a freebie 3D duel. Speaking of freebies, with a trusty Raigeki in our hand, we fire it off for the win, and attack for game with Fire Yaru and Fire Eye. Shardy goes down, and he drops us an armored zombie. We spend the next three, maybe four seconds robbing him, and then make our way to the card shop to save our game. I apologize for some of the background noise. There are some neighbours on the back side of my house that have some feral kids. Can't do much about it. Apparently it's frowned upon to throw stones at young children. Hmm, think I might have come up with a plot point for the rock run. But anywho, on to Bakura. With an empty field, we have no choice but to fire off a dark hole for the goal. Anywho number, I've lost count. Let's hit back with some trivia. This time, we're looking at the card Dragon Piper. In Forbidden Memories, Dragon Piper has the rare subtyping of Jar. This is likely due to the fact that this card is literally pot the trick. In the TCG, it was released in Metal Raiders and later reprinted in Dark Beginnings 2. It was also the first Pyro Flip Monster, and I guess by that extension, the first Fire Flip Monster. For its anime appearances, it debuted in Episode 2 of Duelist Kingdom and later in Episode 27. Both times, it was summoned by Pegasus. That's about it for its card trivia. This duel is taking a bit of time simply because Bakura is stalling us out with defense monsters. Throwing out a Raigeki, we clear away his Millennium Shield and start laying into his life points again. I guess one thing I forgot to mention about Dragon Piper are its compatible equip cards. It's compatible with Salamandra, Invigoration, Dark Energy, Black Pendant, and Malevolent Nuzla. That is a decent stack of equip cards, and is probably, what am I saying probably, it is certain to help us when we eventually need to stall out some of these mages. But that aside, we win, we get an hourglass of life, and Bakura goes down. Stealing his Millennium Necklace, or Ring, I can't remember, we head back to the card shop and save our game. Next up is Maximilian Pegasus. Now, I'm starting to get a little bit worried with my opponents. Why Pegasus of all people? Well, right off the bat, he can drop a 2300 attack point monster, which means that I need to have at least a minimum of two equip cards in my hand before I summon something to the field. That's with the exception of Flame Cerberus, which still needs at least one equip card to be summoned. Oh, there we go. Prime example right there. I fortunately get the attack point tie with Fire Yaru, and just hope that old mate doesn't use a Mega Morph. He sets down a fake trap, which is pretty nice in my favor. Stupidly on my end, I mixed up the attack order of my monsters. Oh well. We'll let it get defeated and hit it back again the next turn. Whilst we take our time to defeat Pegasus, let's get back onto the card trivia. This time, we're going to be looking at the card Fire Yaru, which I'm likely mispronouncing. Fire Yaru hasn't got much trivia. In the TCG, it was released in Legend of Blue Eyes and later in Astral Pack 8 as a short print. It's a fusion material for Vermilion Sparrow, which also released in that set. As for the OCG, 
When this card was printed in Booster Pack 3, some copies of the card were misprinted and had the fire attribute color represented as purple instead of red. As for the anime appearances, this card has none. And that's about it. Defeating his Crow Goblin, we attack for game with a bombastic fire eye. Pegasus goes down and he drops us an Umi, which we are promptly going to discard. Stealing his Millennium Eye, we make our way back to the card shop and save our game. Our next opponent is Ice Spice. Now, the bulk of her deck is comprised mainly of Aqua and Sea Serpent type monsters, which mostly use a Neptune Guardian Star. For those of you that have already figured it out, Neptune Guardian Star is strong against the Mars Guardian Star, which is what my Pyro monsters mainly use. For this duel, I need to remember to set my monsters to their second Guardian Star, otherwise she's just going to get a free attack point boost against me. And immediately, I ignore my own advice and forget to change the Guardian Star. Serves me right on that one. Serving me even more is the dead hand that we drew. Wanting to waste another card in my hand, I'm just going to fire off a dark hole for the goal and end my turn. Thankfully, Ice Spice responds with a face down defense mode, which is likely an Aquamador. Having no other cards in my hand, I'm just going to sink all my chips into Dragon Piper. Oh, there we go. Get to show this off. Right here is a prime example of why Pyros are also considered a difficult type. They are one of the few monster cards in this game that are powered down by field spells. In our case, if an opponent uses the field spell Umi, it reduces our attack power by 500. Other types that share this weakness are machines with Umi and fairies with Dark. There we go, an example of a monster with zero attack points. Which by the way, if you ever attack your opponent's life points directly with a zero attack point monster, the slash attack displays, but no numbers are displayed on screen. Whilst we slowly gain our momentum back, let's cover some trivia. We'll continue from Fire Yoro and look at its fusion, Vermilion Sparrow. In Forbidden Memories, if you fuse a Pyro card with a Warrior, and one of those cards has an attack of 1800 or 1850, the fusion will result in Vermilion Sparrow. The only cards that fit this description are Flame Swordsman, Guilty Knight, and Metal Dragon. Vermilion Sparrow drops from Meadow Mage at any B, C, or D rank. The card was released in Astral Pack 8 and has made no anime appearances. There we go, perfect timing. Ice Spice goes down and we move on to our next opponent after stealing her jewelry. Our next duel is against Kaiba. Kaiba is a tough opponent, given that he can drop a Blue Eyes White Dragon on you and has a number of problem spell cards. At every given turn, if you're on the back foot and are losing momentum in the duels, he'll fuse plenty of monsters over 2100 attack and expect him to do that. This duel right here has given me a small bit of trouble. My ratio of equips to monster cards isn't all that great, and it's causing me a lot of dead hands. Thankfully, we have a Raigeki in our hand, but still no monster cards. This isn't looking well. We fire one off regardless, and Kaiba retaliates with a Flame Cerberus. How the turntables. We draw into zero monsters, but yet another board wipe. So we fire off a second Raigeki. And despite the numerous board wipes, this guy is still coming back with some powerful monsters. Oh. If the footage you're looking at looks a bit more sped up than normal, that's cause it is. Unfortunately, I did not win against Kaiba first try like in my other duels. I drew into too many dead hands and he was consistently summoning monsters like Blue Eyes White Dragon and Twin Headed Thunder Dragon. I've realized up until this point I haven't been keeping track of the number of attempts it's been taking me to finish each duel. Clearly, I've beaten each one first go, but unfortunately, it was not the case with Kaiba. Wow. Thank goodness we saved. So. We try a hand again, and we finally get a monster card turn 1. Despite this, I'm still going to play somewhat cautiously, as I'm very wary of him dropping a Blue Eyes White Dragon on me. I'll feel a little bit more comfortable when I pull out a monster over 3000 attack. And of course it's a freaking shield. If it's not a Blue Eyes White Dragon, it's a Millennium Shield. And at the moment, I can't take out either of them. Drawing a Mystical Moon Equip card, we equip it to Flame Cerberus, and I can take a sigh of relief. Unless we get a cheeky Spellbinding Circle, Crush Card, or Raigeki, we should be right for the rest of this duel. So whilst we have Flame Cerberus on the field, I'll fire up some trivia about it. Flame Cerberus can be summoned by fusing a Beast and Pyro card, so long as both monsters are under 2100 attack. As for card drops, you saw what happened. The card can drop from Hyshin at any B, C, or D rank, albeit at a 0.05% chance. In the anime, this card has only made a brief appearance, that being in Kaiba's briefcase during Episode 1 when he tried to trade all his cards for Blue Eyes White Dragon. As for the TCG, this card was released in Metal Raiders as a common. There is another monster card called Hazy Flame Cerberus, but they are not related whatsoever. It's just a similarity that they're both Cerberuses. 
Sir Bry? No, that doesn't sound right. Sir Bros. It's just the coincidence that they're Sir Bros. We'll go with that. Now, if I'm sounding like I'm pronouncing Sir Bros incorrectly, you can blame the actual spelling of the card. They've misspelt it, so I can't help reading it that way. What I can help, however, is my win rate. Kyber goes down and he drops us a baby dragon. Hooray for us. We steal his rod and we've collected all the Millennium items. With enough material gathered to trigger the strike paper, we start a fire and watch in awe as smoke rises into the sky. With Yugi reactivating the bonfire in the present, we are now able to respawn back to the Shrine of Glory, which I guess is the equivalent of Millennium Filing Shrine. Gaining control of our character, it's time we check out the old Duel Arena, which appears to be on fire. <laughs> I'm so proud of them. We meet up with Jono inside the burning building, and he takes us to a secret shelter where all the firebugs reside. It's time to test out and see if you guys have actually improved since I've been gone. Starting things off with Jono. Now, as an opponent, Jono has gotten significantly stronger, but not enough to make it actually matter. Power-wise, I would put him between Pegasus and Kyber. So long as we summon a monster over 2400 attack, we win. Easier said than done though, the dead draws are running rampant on my end. But I think Fire Yara has redeemed us now. So with that said, let's continue on to the card trivia. But wait Jono, you've gone through all the pyro monsters in this game. What more is there to tell? Well Paisanos, let me take you back to when I first introduced the pyro type. As I've mentioned in this video, and the many before it, Forbidden Memories has a hidden concept called a secondary type, which is an exclusive feature to Forbidden Memories and its GBA equivalents. It's exactly as it sounds, an extra type or archetype added to the card which is not visible to the player. We'll stop for now, as we've just defeated Jono, and he's dropped us a baby dragon. Wow, a second one, jeez. With Jono out of the way, we move across to Tina 2 and pick up back where we left off with that explanation. Now, not all cards have a secondary type, but for those that do, the types were assigned to these cards based on the card artwork, attribute, card names, and flavor text. And of course, good old fashioned Konami randomness. And before you ask, these extra types are not straightforward. There are literally types called mirrors, jars, bagros, thrones, and various other random things, which are purely there to support the fusion mechanics of this game. Given that we're on our last turn, I'll end the trivia here by saying that there are 22 other cards in this game that can be considered pyro monsters. More on those later. For now, it's back to the story, and we did both these duels in one try. Now that we've checked in with our squad, let's head over to the Forbidden Ruins. Old man, I need to know where the mage shrines are located. You have no idea? That is not a surprise. Looks like I have to do everything around here. Heading back to the torch ruins of the palace, we run into a mage soldier who seems to have escaped the earlier inferno. Don't worry, I can fix that. Ah, mage soldier. The shardy of the late game Egypt. So long as we summon a monster over 2200 attack, we win. He's about as strong as the qualifying duelist in the world tournament. So with that said, let's get back to the trivia on pyro dual types. The easiest method to determine if a card has a pyro typing is by using the Salamandra equip card which is only compatible with pyro monsters. The equip card method doesn't necessarily work for all types. Using Electro Whip to determine a female card is a prime example of this. Though it's only intended for female monsters, it is compatible with cards like Hutatsumi Giant. In the case of Salamandra, coincidentally, all 22 cards are compatible with it. But for the reverse scenario, you'd have to rely on your card descriptions as mentioned before to figure out what type the cards are. If all else fails, Try and attempt a fusion if it's possible. If it works, you know at least one of those cards is the type you're looking for. Getting back to the duel, we're on to our last turn. Summoning a Dragon Piper, we take out his Dark Rabbit and attack for game with Flame Cerberus. We win, da -da -da -da. we got a mysterious puppeteer and old mate goes down in one try. Rummaging through the room, we find the map and leave a present on our way out. Let's head back to Sedin to have this map deciphered. Meeting back up with a scruffy old fella, we hand over the map and he takes us to the Forbidden Ruins. Gazing at the monument, we cast our eyes over to the wall where we locate an etched map of Millennium Egypt, which clearly marks out our next targets. Seto sneaks up behind us and tells us that he stationed high mages at each of the locations on the map, all of them armed with the latest firefighting equipment. Leaving with a smug look on his face, we bid farewell to Sedin and get started on getting the whole of Millennium Egypt lit. Now that we have access to all the shrines, it's time to unlock the last pyro card for our deck, which thankfully sits behind the meadow shrine. Hi meadow mage, Jono here, back again with another grind session for your cards. 
This time, we're going after the card Vermilion Sparrow, a 1900 attack beat stick that unfortunately suffers from poor equip card compatibility. Anywho, Meta Shrine is the strongest of all the shrines, raw attack power wise at least. To our benefit, it looks like we've gotten a good starting hand, so I'll cover off more of the Pyro Jewel types while this duel plays out. The first card we're going to look at is Armail, a warrior type monster. This card is an absolute enigma to me. There is nothing about it in the card description or attribute that suggests it should be a Pyro monster. What has likely happened is that somebody at Konami mistook the desert background of this card as fire. Thus, for some stupid reason, decided to categorize it as a Pyro monster despite it obviously looking like a scorpion. Ah oh well. The duel still seems to be going, so maybe I'll chuck in another card. This time, we're looking at Blast Juggler. A machine type monster. This one is a little easier to figure out. Blast Juggler has a fire type attribute, so naturally it makes sense for it to be a pyro card for this game. See? It did not need to be this convoluted. But I guess that's what makes Forbidden Memories the game that it is. Unnecessarily convoluted. Getting back to the duel, how are we going? Yep, we're kicking butt. Attacking his monster tamer with a flame Cerberus, we get ourselves down to the final two turns. Summoning a monster in vain, we draw a Raigeki and activate it for the win. Attacking for game, we won. Duh, 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 duh. And we got a Feral Imp and this took one try. Defeating the Lower Mage, we set a Kerosene Trail all the way up to Kapura. Geez, if there was any place I'd actually like to set on fire in this game, it would be this one. Could you imagine the smell? Lu wow, if you're hungry for a hunk of fat and juicy meat, eat my buddy Pumba here because he is a treat. Come and down and dine on this tasty swine, all you have to do is get in line. Ah, uh, you're aching, yep, yep, yep. For some bacon, yep, yep, yep. He's a big pig, yep, yep. You can be a big pig too. Woo! I am so sorry I just could not help myself with that one. Getting back to the duel, we dark hole for the goal away his problematic gate guardian cards, leaving us an empty field where the bombastic fire eye can run amok. I have that much faith I'm putting in face down attack position. Now I have no idea what Kapura is going to top deck against us. It is entirely likely that he can draw a second Gat Guardian or even a Black Skull Dragon, which he definitely has in his deck. For the time being, I think he's cycling through his weaker cards. So I think we're out of the woods for at least a turn or two. But just to be safe, I'm going to throw as many equip cards as I can at the Bombastic Fire Eye. Whilst we wait and see what he's going to throw at us, let's continue the Pyro Jewel type analysis. This time, we're looking at the Fiend card Candle of Fate. This is another obvious card, if you think outside the box, albeit ever so slightly. Though the attribute of the card is dark, the card image, card name, and card description indicate that this thing should be on fire, and thus be classified as a pyro card. Regardless, if you don't believe me, you can try fuse this card with a beast to see if you get a flame Cerberus. Getting back to the action, it looks like Kapura has top decked the Black Skull Dragon. I knew something like that was going to happen, that's why I boosted up Fire Eye to 3800 attack points. Remember kids, Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories does not like you. And this is another reminder of that. This is probably one of the longer duels I've had against Kapura. We're actually going tit for tat. I'm not too worried. The minute his field gets empty, we have more than enough attack points to take him down. So reverting back to him, we attack him for 1700 and he has a measly 2700 to defend against us with. Ah, oh, there we go. Even better. We fire off a Raigeki for the win and attack for game with Fire Eye. We win da -da -da -da, a Togex, and we did this in one try. With the Meadow Shrine defeated, we can finally set it on fire. With the Meadow Mage defeated, we now have access to Vermilion Sparrow. This card directly replaces Cherub and Fire Knight and one Dragon Piper. Getting back to Egypt, we make our way to the second most flammable shrine, and that is the Forest Shrine. The Forest Mage should be a cakewalk, as the bulk of his cards are weak to Mars Guardian Stars, which is what all Pyro cards have. Of course, to forever humble me, the game bricks my hand. And bricks it again. Fun times right ahead. Whilst we pull ourselves out of this hole, let's continue the dual type pyro analysis. The card we'll be looking at is Crimson Sunbird, a winged beast monster. This one is a little more straightforward. By little, I mean a friggin' lot. Crimson Sunbird has a fire attribute, and the card description literally says that this thing is on fire. I have nothing but love for this flaming chicken. Speaking of things that are on fire, that brings us to the next card. This time, we're also going to be looking at the dragon card Darkfire Dragon, the literal embodiment of Salamandra. Other than the card attribute being dark, everything else about this card suggests that it's definitely a pyrotype. 
The card looks like it's a genuine Serpent of Fire, and the card description says that it has scorching flames that wipe out enemies in the blink of an eye. See? Easy to figure out that that one's a Pyro Monster. And I think it's actually one of the more common ones used by speedrunners. But enough of that. Looks like that we're on to our last turn. Summoning a Flame Cerberus, we wipe out his card with a million Sparrow, and attack his life points with our remaining monsters. We win, da -da 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 -da, and we got a Fire Yo. Oh, welcome back. We did this in one try. Sparking up another fire trail, we make our way to Anubisius, who definitely looks like he's been marinated, wrapped, and ready to be put on the barbecue. Let's jump right into things. The cards we need to watch out for in this duel are the Great Moth line of monsters. Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth on this field is boosted to 4000 attack, so we really need to be wary of that card. Realistically, however, anything over 3200 attack is more than sufficient to deal with this shrine. And geez. Look at that metric buttload of equip cards. This is why Fire Eye is unironically such a great monster in this deck. It is compatible with almost everything. The opposite, Vermilion Sparrow, does my absolute head in. I'm not actually certain if I'm going to have him for the final duels, but we'll make that call when we get to them. But all things aside, I think we're actually having a better time against Anabesius than we did against his lower mage. We're actually onto the last few turns. Summoning something in complete vain, we pop off a Raigeki for the win. Attacking for game with a million Sparrow, he goes down in one try. Da -da -da -da, he drops us a big insect. Flame, dear flame. Being conveniently wrapped in tissues, we set his shrine ablaze. With two shrines sufficiently immolating, it's time we take on Seto 2. Returning to the Duel Arena, I am surprised to find out it's not on fire. Somebody's getting let go today. Jono exclaims that Seto took off with Tina under the suspicion that Seul's the one torching the shrines. Well, I'll be damned if somebody takes credit for my hard work. After we dispatch this Labyrinth Mage, I have a few choice words for Haishin and his gang. Focusing back onto the duel, the Labyrinth Mage's deck is mainly comprised of Gate Guardian pieces and Gate Guardian himself. The sheer fact that he didn't summon one turn one means we're going to have an easy time. Instead of trivia, a question has popped into my mind that has been raised in earlier videos. People have asked if you can beat this game purely with burn cards. By burn cards, we're talking about spells like Ukazi, Sparks, Tremendous Fire, etc. The short answer is no. The combined total damage with those cards only reaches 5,550. Sorry guys, would have loved to have run that one for you. But what I'm not sorry about is what I just did to Labyrinth Mage. He goes down in one try, and we resume the story. Navigating through the Labyrinth, we find Haishin and Seto detaining Tina. Seto has yet again another smug look on his face and tells us that he was only using her as bait to lure out the real culprits. Wow, never thought I'd actually use the actual game plot as a storyline this time around. But I digress, let's jump into a duel with Seto. Seto 2 is going to be a problem for us if he manages to summon out a Gate Guardian. It takes me at least two rounds of equips to be able to hit over it, which doesn't really give me much confidence for the final six. Thankfully, we get lucky turn 1, and he summons down, I think it's either a Sanger of Thunder or a Twin Head. Let's find out. It is a Twin Head. There we go. Jono, you're a psychic. Now, normally at this point, I'd be rattling off more trivia. But, given that we have two heavy beaters already on the field, I think we're on to our last turn. Powering up the bombastic Fire Eye, we take out his next monster with Fire Yaru, and attack for game with the other two. We win. Da -da -da -da, and that was friggin' easy, and he dropped us a Guardian of the Sea. And we did this in one try. With Seto defeated, we exit the shrine and head back to the Duel Arena. We bid farewell to our minions, because the rest of these shrines aren't going to torch themselves. The next shrine on our list is the Desert Shrine. This one should be a cakewalk. The strongest monster we really need to contend with is Brachio Raiders to 2200. Heck, when we get to Martus, outside of Brachio Radius, his strongest actual card on paper is Summon Skull. He can't even get powered up by Wasteland. So it goes to show how much of a shardy level threat these guys are. So with all that said, time for some more trivia. The next dual type pyro monster we're looking at is Dissolve a Rock. Ironically, it would have been powered up by this field. The only part of it that signifies that it might be a pyro monster is in its card description. It mentions that it's a monster born from the lava pits and generates intense heat. That's about it. No attribute, no name. And I guess the only other thing I can think of is that Dissolve Rock is achieved when you fuse a Pyro card with a Rock card, so long as both are under a thousand attack points. I also think that I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. It might be called Dissolve Rock. Anywho, we're on to our final turn. We power up our Flame Cerberus and take down his twin-headed King Rex. 
We win, Desert Mage goes down in one try, and we get a Ryuka Shin. Let's start that fire trial and say hi to Mardis. AKA, for the purposes of this run, Millennium Pinwheel. Right off the bat, we don't draw too strong of a first hand. I'm going to try fake the opponent out by setting a Vermilion Sparrow in attack position. In direct response, he pulls out his strongest monster, Summon Skull, and powers it up to 3000 no less. Thankfully, we have a trusty Raigeki in our hand, we clear it, and I think from this point on, we'll be all good. So, let's get back to the trivia. The card we're looking at this time round is the Plant Monster Firegrass. Despite it having an Earth attribute, the name literally says Firegrass, and the description says that it's a fire-breathing plant found growing near volcanoes. Safe to say, it's a Pyro card. Additionally, so long as both monsters are under 700 attack, you can achieve this card via fusion by taking a plant and a pyro monster and fusing them together. So add that to your pyro reasoning and smoke it, and let's get back to the duel. We're actually on to our last few turns. Beefing up the bombastic fire eye, we take out his Kazajin with fire yo, and we attack him directly with fire eye. Going tit for tat with his stone D, hmm, ignore my phone going off in the background, we're on to our actual final turn. Beefing up the bombastic fire eye once more, we attack once, bam, love it, and attack for the last time. We win, duh, 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 and we got a hologram. And Mardis went down in one try. Showing Pinwheel the Immolation Pyromancy, we set fire to the Desert Shrine. Okay, I can't put this off any longer. It's time we take on the Sea Shrine. But before we go ahead and jump into the Wadul, we're going to make some modifications to our deck. We kick out two copies of Dragon Piper and two copies of Vermilion Sparrow. We're going to replace those with the Yami Field Spell, given that two of them fuse into a Dark Energy, one copy of Umi, and one copy of Forest. Why am I putting Umi in there? Well, if you fuse Dark Hole with Umi, you get the card Eternal Drought, which takes out all fish monsters on the field. A very handy Elemental Raigeki. What's unfortunate, despite my best efforts, I draw a Brick Turn 1, and he starts punishing me with his Sea King Dragon. We're going to fire off a Dark Hole after we get rid of a few Equip Cards, and hope we draw a better card next turn. Let's see what his response is. Tag away, tag back in, and he's attacked us with a Deep Sea Shark. That's not good. We are on Struggle Street. I'm going to fire off a Board Wipe card just to try and bait the AI into summoning something in Defense Mode or setting a Spell and Trap card. Rageki, let's see. Oh, that's not good. Uh, okay. We have survived once more because Karyushin's only 2300 attack. With all the remaining cards we have left, we power up a Fire Yaro making sure to remember to not set it to a Mars type and survive this part of the duel. Now, the AI decides to summon Amphibious Bugroth and sacrifices it against my monster. Why does it do this? Well, we are actually in the range for the AI Suicide Glitch. If your life points are low enough for the opponent to attack you directly and win, it will ignore all equip cards that are attached to your monster. The result of that is what you saw on screen. I've only ever achieved this once in one of my other recorded playthroughs. I think it was against Kapura using the Sea Serpent deck or the Dinosaur deck. Anywho, Ocean Mage goes down in one try, and we make our way over to Segmenton. Let's lay some oil down and get ready to light a match. Science fact, oil floats on water, so you're able to set it fire and keep it alight till all the oil burns out. This is very useful to know if you want to have a set duration for an oil candle at home. or if you have grand plans to set fire to an ocean in the middle of the night. That's not even a pyromaniac joke, it's actually a very janky way to be rescued by the water at night time if you run out of flares. But anywho, Segmenton. He is the second weakest mage in Forbidden Memories, at least for a normal run. In this case with our pyro deck, as you can clearly see, I've done more prep for him than what I would have done for heavy hitters like Kapura. Given that pyro cards are powered down by Umi, my first call to action was to change the field. Thankfully, with cards like Flame Cerberus, it has a second Guardian Star of Pluto, which is great as it hits over the default Neptune type held by most Aqua Monsters. Our triple headed Flaming Lion was going to be my main win condition against this mage. So, whilst we're on the front foot in this duel, let's go over some more Pyro trivia. The next dual type Pyro on our list is Fire Kraken, and this one is very straightforward. Despite being an Aqua Monster, its attribute is Fire. The name literally says fire, and the description says a fiery squid that can maintain its flames underwater. Everything about this card says it should be a fire type, and I'm happy with that. What I'm not happy with are Millennium Shields. Those things suck. There is at least a card in this game called Stop Defense, which changes your opponent's defense position monsters to attack. I won't be using that card for the type runs, I can't see myself needing it. 
but I do think it's going to be a staple when I eventually do the character runs. Heck, it actually makes people like Shardy slightly more viable because of that. Yes, you heard me use the word Shardy and viable in the same sentence. But enough of that. Getting back to the duel, we've finally cleared his field and can start attacking his life points. I don't see really anything he can throw at us, so this duel's in the bag. Powering up a fire Yaro one more time. Goodbye to you, Turtle Man. And we attack again with Flame Cerberus. We win. Duh, 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 and we got again in. And we did this in one try. With the oil fire sufficiently spreading, we bid farewell to this environmental disaster and make our way to the Mountain Shrine. Now, through the sheer power of laziness, I have neglected to restore my deck to the way it was before I challenged Sekmaten. My bad on that one. I have blind confidence that I should do well enough with the cards at hand. But, I really do have a shoddy memory. I completely forgot that this shrine is actually the second toughest. Why do I say this? Purely due to the abundance of twin-headed thunder dragons and the variety of field boosted dragon cards like Sayaru, Black Skull Dragon and Meteor Black Dragon. With twin-headed thunder dragon currently being the most spammable thing this guy is throwing at me. Seriously, we have some problems here. Nonetheless, with some trusty equipped card spamming, I think we have the upper hand in this duel. So let's get back to the type analysis. The next card on our list is Fire Reaper, a zombie type monster. This one is another straightforward one. You can clearly see that there is a flaming arrow in the card. The card's name literally says Fire, and the description says that it's a creature that deals out punishment with its flaming arrows. Based on that, the game has classified it as a pyro card. Happy days right there. And what's even happier is that right gecko we fired off. Attacking for game with Flame Cerberus, we win. Da -da -da -da. We get a Queen's double, and this was defeated in one go. Onwards and upwards to the High Kage himself, Atenza. The strategy for Atenza will be to fill up our hand with equip cards and dump them all into a Flame Cerberus. On top of that, I have to be careful with setting my back row. I can't do it blindly, otherwise he will respond to them with a Harpy's Feather Duster. As for his own back row, Atenza does not have any trap cards. The card on the back end of his field is likely a Dragon Treasure, Swords of Revealing Light, or Shadow Spell. Unfortunately, despite my earlier efforts, he's managed to take me out with a Black Skull Dragon. That's not good. But thankfully, the Raigeki we set earlier takes care of this problem. Though, it's only a band-aid solution as Flame Cerberus is far too weak to do anything. The goal from this point will be to get out another strong monster. I need to start dumping my hand and redoing that strategy to power up a Flame Cerberus. Alternatively, I think I might grind for another Raigeki and do the same strategy that I had done before. Thankfully for us, he decides to go for a Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon Fusion instead of a second card. That would have been more problematic for us. With a good Dark Hole for the goal, we throw the game back to him and he responds by setting a spell card. We've just won this. Beefing up our monster card, we attack him directly and he goes down. Da -da 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 -da. We won a Tyhone and we did this in one try. Blazing it up atop the mountain, we set fire to the shrine, ignore Seto 2 and make our way back to the overworld. With the entirety of Aegis on fire, we make a detour and do some S-Tech farming. Given the strength of our deck, we're definitely going to need some better equipped cards. I can go for the other cards like Dian, Keto and Crush card, but I think I'll hold back unless I absolutely need it. From this point on, I'm going to rely primarily on Flame Cerberus and Vermilion Sparrow. Our final final 6 deck looks like this. The reason I say final final is because I have made several iterations of this deck, and this was the build that worked best for me. If it looks a bit broken, just know that it needs to be. Returning to Egypt, we need to gain entry into the Vast Shrine, which is heavily guarded. I think we need to bite the bullet and turn ourselves in. Again with a smirk, Seto opens the door to the precinct where we get apprehended by Sebek and Neku. In an act of stupidity masqueraded as great sportsmanship, both of them challenge me to a duel. Mistake number one. Ah, Sebek, Sebek, Sebek. This guy is relatively easy. So long as you can pull a monster over 3000 attack, you win this duel. And that's about all there is to it. Beefing up our Vermilion Sparrow to 3900, I think it's safe to say we can start off some trivia. There are 13 more cards in the dual type list, so let's see if we can wrap those up in the next few duels. So up next is the Beast card Firewing Pegasus. Due to the card art, the name Firewing, and it having a fire attribute, this card is classified as a Pyro Monster. Pretty straightforward. It's a little bit harder to verify in-game as its attack power is too high to fuse into anything. The next card is Kagamusha of the Blue Flame. This one is a bit left of field. The only reason it's been classified as a Pyro card is because of its name Blue Flame, 
and a description saying that it's a ruler of a blue flame. That's it. Through that loose definition, it's a pyro monster. I'll pause things there. Sebek goes down, and old mate drops us the 13th grave. Sulking away defeat, we take on Neku. Now as you've seen with other runs, Neku is a bit more problematic. We have to contend with his Skull Knight, which tops off at about 3150 attack points. He also likes to beef it up with some dark energies, so be wary of that. By that extension, he also has a Zoa with the same problem, as you can see on screen. Clearing his field, we beef up a Vermilion Sparrow and get back to the dual type analysis. The next card on the list is Metal Dragon, a machine type monster. The only reason why this card has been classified as a pyro is due to its description of being a fire breathing dragon. Don't ask me how a train can breathe fire. The next card is also a machine and we're looking at Machine King. The only way this is classified as a pyro monster is due to its description of saying that it launches blasts of fire. That's it. In the blink of an eye, Neku goes down and he drops us a jellyfish. After defeating Pleb 1 and Pleb 2, we encounter Haishin, who seems to have respawned pretty well considering the Molotov incident earlier. Rightfully cranky, he challenges us to a duel. Right off the bat, we draw a dead hand, but having a widespread ruin is always handy. He responds by setting a face down. Lucky for us, but unfortunately, I draw another equip card. By setting a second back row, I've triggered off a feather duster, and draw into yet another dead hand. We are not looking too good. Unfortunately, Jafar responds by summoning a media black dragon. Not good for us, but thankfully with a Mega Morph and two Beast Fangs, we power up a Flame Cerberus to be strong enough to hit over him. Happy days with that. The reason we don't attack into him is because the back row card he has set at the moment is a widespread ruin. I need to empty my hand till I draw another monster card, so I'm going to power this guy up to some ludicrous attack power. Whilst we wait for the next card, I'm going to fire off some very rapid dual types. Flame Ghost, Flame Manipulator, and Flame Swordsman are all dual type pyro monsters because of their name, fire in the card image, and all three of their descriptions mentioning something about wielding fire. Those three are pretty straightforward and very common, so I'm not expecting anyone to be surprised by those. The next card, however, is Launcher Spider, which is rather surprising. It scrapes into being a pyro monster due to it having a fire attribute. Whoa, that was weird. I think I just had a head spin just then. Told you some of these runs are bad for your health. Anywho, sharing the fire attribute, we have the Beast Warrior Garuzis. This one scrapes in as a pyro monster for the exact same reason. Four more cards to go, and let's throw in the ritual monster Yamadron. This one is easy, it's literally a fire breathing dragon. Says so in the description and in the card art. Finishing on time, Haishin goes down and he drops us a pumpkin. Saddened by his defeat, he runs off before we get the chance to torch him. Seto picks up the Millennium Fire Hose and we follow him outside. Laughing in our faces, he reveals that the shrines he set up were decoys and that the real Egyptian firefighting militia has been hidden on the ground this whole time. Wow, how the turntables. Now as this duel starts, I want to drop a massive disclaimer. Remember, the purpose of my deck is to be massively jam-packed with equip cards as much as the game would allow me. The duel you are witnessing here is not really a true representation of a normal run. I got insanely lucky to the point where I'm contemplating invalidating this run. I'll let the door play out and you can see for yourselves. Regardless, it happened, and I have to accept it as is. Throwing off a Raigeki for the win, we attack the game with Flame Cerberus. Seto 3 goes down and we got an A power rank, not something I was expecting this deck to pull off. Upon Seto's defeat, Haishin sneaks up and whips out his Millennium Persuasion device once more. Unfortunately, he's whipped it out on the wrong person. It's okay, buddy. Happens to the best of us. Unfortunately, as a result of this, he's caught the attention of Gwyn, the Chief Fire Warden. Gwyn is unhappy that Haishin has removed his firefighting safety gear. As a direct result, he decides to reprimand him by setting him on fire to prove a point. Being highly appreciative of him disposing of our enemy, we offer the sign of peace. Not taking very kindly to our offering, he challenges us to a duel. Plin plin plon, mother trucker. Now, Chief Fire Warden Gwyn isn't too intimidating an opponent. He's about as strong as Seto too, and lacks a Gate Guardian. So, with a sufficiently beefed up Vermilion Sparrow, I have three cards left to cover, so let's just jump right into them. The first card is Marvelous, a winged beast card that gets classified as a pyro monster by being a phoenix, and the card description says that it has fiery breath that is extremely scorching. Second last card is Tyhone number two, a dragon type monster. It has a fire attribute, and its description says that it spits fireballs at its enemies. It is also the only dragon card that can fuse into Red-Eyes Black Dragon. 
I'll pause the trivia for now because it's time for a 3D battle. Explosions left, right and centre. Find it weird that the card used lightning attacks despite being a pyro monster, but whatever. I don't make this game. Firing off a Raigeki for the win, we attack directly with Vermilion Smarrow. We win a Curse of Dragon, and that's phase one down. With a flash of white light, Gwyn transforms into his true form, and we're thrust once again into the heat of battle. For the second phase of this duel, our opponent does not have any spell or trap cards. This is great. Widespread Ruin is really going to help us. In another act of crazy good luck, he summons out a perfectly ultimate Great Moth instead of a Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Again, I got really lucky with this seed and I have never seen him do this. Before I forget, let me cover off the lucky last dual type Pyro Monster, and this card is none other than Meteor Black Dragon. Unlike its lesser counterpart, Meteor Black Dragon has a fire attribute, and has a description saying that it has a burning hide made of a meteorite. With my timing on point, it's time for a 3D battle. With Fire Yaru kicking the ever-loving crap out of Blackluster Soldier, we hand the turn back over to Gwyn. Drawing two Raigekis in our hands, I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. We're going to fire off one Raigeki and attack with Fire Yaru, and pass the turn back over to him. Now, instead of hitting off another Raigeki, I'm going to try empty my hand just so I can see if I can get a Flame Cerberus. I haven't shown off the 3D animation for that card, and I'm going to try my best to show it off in this last duel. Again, I forgot that I hadn't done that yet. Unfortunately, we don't draw it. Rather than drag things out, it's time we end things once and for all. Launching an attack with Fire Yaro, it turns out that was the last one. Gwyn goes down, and we won, da -da -da -da, and El Dean. Fading into nothingness, a decision lies before us on whether we should link the fire. Because we ain't no bitch, we decide to play that victory song and sit atop our throne like the Dark Lord that we are. So, can you beat Yu-Gi-Oh Forbidden Memories using a Pyro-only deck? Yes, yes you can provided you have patience to grind and a crap ton of equip cards. Oh, as for the final six, that took seven attempts to complete. Far out. On to the run wrap up. The campaign took 61 duels to complete and accrued a total of six losses, five of those being at the hands of the final six. Free mode consisted of 274 duels purely due to start ship farming, which brings our total duel count to 335. The average duel during the campaign took about 3 minutes and 21 seconds. Adding that all together, the campaign took a total of 3 hours and 21 minutes to complete. On to the deck rankings. This deck sits comfortably at the bottom of DT. The versatility of Fire Yaro is what stopped Pyro from becoming its own low tier category. The sheer fact that I kept it in the final deck is a testament as to how great this card was. I'd pick it any day over Vermilion Sparrow. Oh, and the Christmas deck we got from Santa sits at the very top. It's quite literally pocket station rituals. What did you expect? And with all that said, runs over. Hi everyone, Jono here. Thank you all so much for making it to the end of this video. First challenge run of 2024. Let's get some hype going in the comments. Before I get to the formalities, I just want to give a massive shout out to Lily Laser Triple Six, Adair Three Three Two Seven, Some Lesty, Costero Des, Cyphate, Mephisto Mars Twenty One Eighty Five, Arten Summer, and Robert Walker Twenty Six Ninety One. You are all truly awesome people. Thank you for your ongoing support to this channel. There is definitely a backlog of types you've all requested from me. I may take longer with some of them purely because I want to give them the justice that they deserve. So until then, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to stay notified of my latest release. And as always, stay awesome people. Hope you all draw a Raigeki for the win, and I'll be seeing you all soon.